everybody. Here's Sasha's also just come from New Zealand. We have so many different countries represented today and it's really a thrill and uh, I hope um, Sumi and Amy you know that this is a very special uh, collab <laughs> salon that we're just so happy to have you here. Um, and I we don't have time for everyone to introduce themselves. So before we get going, I'm going to pass this on to Charlie, who's going to get us to do some kind of introduction. And I am giddy with excitement about this collab salon. So um, how about everybody a big two handed welcome to Amy and Sumi from reauthoring teaching. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And yeah. take it away. So we're going to start with the video, right? So do we just do we just jump right in, um, or do we want I to think, do? Anything? I think Sumi and and um, uh, and Amy should first introduce what they're going to do, and uh, and also to kind of orient us to the to the video. Excellent. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for gathering for this summit today. Um, I'm so surprised and happy to see so many faces from all around the world. And uh, this summit is about um, exposing and challenging the very sneaky and quite insidious uh, operation of machinalization. <laughs> so, um, oh, before we go into the, maybe we can, should we introduce ourselves or should we? You and you and Amy, sure. Uh, okay, so I'll just do it quickly. I currently live in the Kyushu City in Japan, and I practice narrative therapy at a mental health clinic, and as well as my private practice. Uh, Amy, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yes. So I um, I'm Amy Drucker. I live in Toronto, Canada. And um, I practice narrative therapy um, in independent practice. And I'm also getting to have narrative conversations with folks at um, an addictions agency where I do some quote unquote clinical supervision, um, which is not how I think about it. That word doesn't really fit, but co-learning with, with folks um, at an addictions agency. So, um, yeah, to expose and challenge this machinalization, it is impossible to do it alone because it's a gigantic problem. So uh, it means so much to me and us to be able to take the first crack at this giant problem uh, with being surrounded by super warm-hearted uh, loving faces around us so thank you so much and then uh, uh, today I invited um, I took a chance and invited machinalization to join this summit and uh, yeah he had a nerve to accept it right away and then send us this video uh, right away so he must have been pretty pumped to share uh, what he's got so shall we watch the video? Could I just add in for people Absolutely. who haven't, um, I think some people have seen it already. And if you have, we just have a question that we're just going to put in the um, chat box just to help guide if you want to have some additional guidance, but otherwise just watch it. Thank you, Peggy.
Welcome everyone, my name is Machinalization. I would like to thank you all for inviting me to speak at this global summit today, especially when this gathering is about resisting me, which I found very generous of you guys to invite me here. So to respond to your generosity with mine, I decided to share my story about how I successfully machinalized Sumi and many, many others. To protect my privacy, please allow me to wear this friendly face today like I always do. Just in case you haven't met me or heard about me yet, my name is Machinalization because my job is to machinalize as many humans as possible to maximize the worldwide productivity in the most friendly and unthreatening manner. I usually target young students and adults who are pressured to study or work very hard for their future, for their future happiness with more financial and social security. I also target good-hearted parents who want to secure the similar kind of happiness with their children. I also target sons and daughters who strive to achieve the similar kind of happiness so that their parents can feel relief. So as you can guess, pretty much every guess, pretty much everybody can be my target in the modern world society. Oh, and my boss is kind of famous. Have you heard about capitalism? It has been such an honor to work for this world famous boss and have his support and giant power on my side. Hey Jappy, are you watching this? I am at the International Summit against me. You must be so proud of me. Let me go right into talking about my main tactics and tricks to machinalize Sumi. The first trick is to replace Sumi's original glasses of joy, adventure, and creativity through which the yet to be known can seem so exciting and irresistible with the glasses of taskization that I generously provide for free. That I generously provide for free. Obviously, I have to do this extremely slowly and silently so that Sumi does not notice. Through the glasses of taskization that I provide for free, everything looks like another daunting task to get done, or potential task that Sumi may be asked to take potential task that Sumi may be asked to take on in the future. This way I can effectively turn off Sumi's spirit that is too fearless and hungry for adventure and creativity, because such spirit gets in my way and my work big time. With the glasses of taskization on, Sumi will mechanically senses what seems to be expected in the situation and mechanically puts together something that looks like quote unquote good enough product, which I call just get it done mentality, which was one of the first cultural practice that Sumi was in shock to Sumi was in shock to notice when she first started interviewing people in Japan three years ago, and obviously she ended up living it herself now. As long as I keep her nicely drowning in the piles of tasks, the guilt of running behind the tasks will get Sumi to feel disentitled to have any fun or rest, and get her to spend ridiculous amount of hours all along with her laptop, with unpreferred kind of food and sleep, with the just get it done mentality, just get it done mentality, so that she can get her face above the water and somehow breathe again. By the way, do you know why it takes such ridiculous amount of time for Sumi to get things done? It's like hitting the gas and the brake at the same time really hard when you're driving. So the car hardly moves any so the car hardly moves any distance, but the brake starts to burn itself sooner or later. This tactic of making her work long hours without a guilt-free break ended up working brilliantly with Sumi, slowly isolating her and impoverishing and suffocating Sumi's life quality, and suffocating Sumi's life quality, her spirit, and her soul. Sumi, of course, hated this joyless way of living, and I was loving it. What I love about Japan so much is that I have all the convenience stores, drug stores, and TV commercials solidly sticking up for me by selling all these colorful magical beverages and tablets 24-7 that get people working faster without feeling tired, sleepy, or hungry. Sleepy or hungry. Because my work here is way too easy, I can get to demachinalize myself, kick back, and just enjoy the moment, just like humans that I haven't machinalized yet do. 
Hey guys, now let me introduce my reliable buddies. I could never get to where I am today without these guys' soul and help. The first buddy is Positive Expectation. Positive Expectation loves traveling, so I let it use my air miles all the time so that it can travel as far as possible, as far as possible, and spread some good words about Sumi. I know that that would nicely pressure Sumi to raise up the bar for what could be really considered as quote unquote good enough. The next buddies are Busyness Runner Twins. Guilt of running behind is the older brother and sense of obligation is younger brother. They follow Sumi everywhere, even into her private time and space. Even when Sumi's finally try to give herself a tiny moment of freedom from me and try to have freedom from me and try to have a good last with good people before she forgets how to, the twin has no mercy at all and whispering to Sumi's ears all the time limits that she's already behind. The twin slightly guilt trips her into bailing out of fun plans with her friends or family fun plans with her friends or family time and instead gets her to spend ridiculous amount of hours with her laptop day and night seven days a week without a guilt-free break just to unburden herself from never-ending tasks. Want to know my secret trick to keep Sumi suffering without a break, especially when she is the kind of person who loves freedom and quite the contrary to being obedient, as some of you may have noticed. This is how the magic line goes. Sumi, you're almost there. Suffer just for now for your better future. It'll be all worth it in the end. And you'll be surprised to see how huge population in Japan is willing to mobilize themselves to suffer if the better future is quote unquote promised by me. So please be careful with using this trick because it just works dangerously well. The crucial part of my job is to make sure that Sumi keeps producing quote unquote good enough looking products at whatever cost. Even though human Sumi may not see much of her genuine heart in the final product that Machina Light Sumi has produced, that doesn't really matter as long as the final product long as the final product gets positive feedback from others and leads Sumi to be asked to do similar tasks again. Human Sumi sighs quietly, dreading to spend many more hours in isolation without joy again. But I'll have a big grin on my face. The crucial trick here is to keep Sumi here is to keep Sumi's feelings, such as her dilemmas and questioning feelings, all silenced so that they nicely disappear into silence as if they didn't exist in the first place. And that makes my work a lot easier and the cycle of machinalization can keep feeding itself and never end. Do you want to know why it's important to keep Sumi busy and rushed without any peace of mind, exhausted, isolated, silenced, and heavily stressed? The answer is to keep Sumi desperate to unburden herself so that she will easily buy into my slogan, suffer just for now for your better future, and keep applying that just get it done mentality to everything, every day. By doing so, Sumi is ultimately volunteering herself to repeat the cycle forever. This way, Sumi will never be able to afford the time, peace of mind, and good, and good comrades to take a moment together to question the status quo, question me, imagine alternative possibilities, and invent better ways of doing things. This secures my long, thriving, happy life. And as it repeats the cycle and re prevails in the society, it takes less and less and less work on my part. Do you know how I can tell if my machinalization is working properly? I pay careful attention to how many precious stories are being noticed and remembered by Sumi. If machinalization is working well, every day feels like a boring repetition. So Sumi cannot tell yesterday from today or last month from this month. She cannot even remember one precious thing from what happened this morning. In that state, the time feels like at least 15 times faster than when Sumi used to live in Canada. That means that I did an excellent job. 
And last but not least, my boss Cappy always got my back and lent me all the popular discourses that allow me to get away with my immoral practices of scapegoating those who I machinalized. There are too many favorites, so I'll introduce some of them written in yellow. The first discourse is about a kind of adult that you should be by now. You are a respect-worthy member of society if you can manage to make yourself happy within the existing societal structure. If not, it may suggest the lack of your effort and ability, your mental weakness or personality problems. You are not entitled to have rest or fun if you're not on top of your to-do list. The second type of discourse is about praising and honoring busyness as long as it's work-related. Being busy means that you are a well-valued, productive, or successful member of society. Good for you! Even if work might spill over into your private sphere out of necessity, don't ever let your private problems spill over at your private problems spill over into your work life. That is never acceptable. One way pour over only. The third type of discourse is about your worth as a worker being strictly determined by your productivity. Work is work. You don't have to feel happy, good, or interested about your work as long as you're doing the job right. Ultimately, even if you're so depressed from overworking and lost a reason to live or to struggle for, as long as you can keep up to yourself and manage your job well, the company won't judge you. At least not yet. Okay, that's all the secrets that I'm happy to share for now. Did you guys recognize me or any of my tricks? You might not because I'm secretly very anal about customizing my tricks to suit the local context to disguise as friendly as face. So the effects on human can have great variation, which makes my work nicely blend in to any society in the world. All right, everybody, thank you for your attention and recognizing the significance of our work. We wish you all great busyness, success, and happiness in the future. I can't wait to come visit your town one day. Bye. <laughs>
really human again uh, when I came back from the trip in July. So when I made this decision to do this, I had to take this pretty big risk that machinalization might really try to crack me down and make me work really long hours to prepare mm -hmm. uh, this for the salon so that I can measure up a positive expectation that I think. Mm. So what do you think it was that made it worth taking the risk that, that you knew was there, but you decided to do it anyway? What, what made it worth doing or maybe even important to do? I think there are two parts to it. I think there was a crucial lead up that happened um, that was crucial to for me to make this decision to do this at the salon. Then the crucial lead up was for me to uh, rediscover my commitment to not to compromise ethical integrity. And this rediscovery happened when I was uh, joining in any supervision sessions with really uh, super passionate social workers with um, crystal clear um, sense of ethical commitments. And I could get to join in any uh, supervision sessions in Toronto and um, being exposed to, um, yeah, someone speaking so explicitly and powerfully about their ethical dilemmas mm -hmm. um, was uh, really shocking. Shocking um, in the sense that I, I used to have that kind of conversation, like it was a taken for granted part of my everyday work life when I was working as a community worker in Vancouver in Canada um, but that's not the case anymore in my current work setting. Mm -hmm. I, um, when I first came back to Japan I, I think I had a, lots of ethical dilemmas that I could notice and then I think I was speaking up about it but um, it wasn't so welcome. And I came to reluctantly accept that people are working for making living and not really work um, that they're not necessarily in the pursuit of ethical integrity. That's not really a top priority for everyday conversation. So, um, yeah, I came to reluctantly accept that. And then uh, I guess I, over time I learned to work reasonably within the limits that I don't agree with. So, um, yeah, and then over time, once I start working that way, I think I started slipping into this just get it done mentality because what's the point of using my energy for trying to change something I cannot change. So and that's where I got pretty vulnerable to machinalization, I think. So um, yeah, the rediscovery of my commitment to really um, never want to lose touch with my pursuit of ethical integrity and really wanting to get back that hungry attitude towards ethical integrity, that hunger that I was forgetting. And I really was not okay. It was really, really painful, shocking, but also life-saving rediscovery for me. So when I came back to Japan, I was really um, recommitted to never lose this hunger that I finally get back. And so that, that was the first part. And then the second part was, um, yeah, when 
Peggy suggested about the possibility of um, doing the salon theme. Um, yeah, I just had to ask Amy that to interview me about my dilemma, what scares me about it, and about what really tempts me. And then it wasn't too easy. I, it wasn't too hard, I think, to um, to know what is my ethical commitment about this, and an ethical commitment about airing out machinalization is that um, I. I feel like I have privilege that I have experienced very um, free spirited way of living in Vancouver. I could, I have experienced the time going slower, having um, this, yeah, this feeling that being surrounded by comrades and colleagues that I could speak about my ethics and values, like living my everyday life more in the presence of my values. So, um, yeah, and then I also, I, I also have a privilege that I have spent my first two years in Japan, interviewing Japanese people, um, when I was noticing this machinalization phenomenon in Japan, I was really shocked to notice this um, just get it done mentality. Um, yeah, the machinalizing way of um, discourses. But I was noticing those things more as an outsider. I wasn't really experiencing it as an insider. So I, I had a, this first two years of um, co-researching with um, clients that I, yeah, have conversation with. So I think because of that two years, when I start um, getting more and more infected by machinalization, I could, I could recognize it that, oh my God, I am getting infected by what I first noticed when I first came back to Japan. And I... So in a sense, it, mm, it allowed me, it allowed me to refuse to treat it as a matter of individual. Like it's, it feels like it's my personal problem, my personal weakness, my lack of managing skills, because society really tried to convince me that way. But I also, yeah because of that privilege first two years um yeah i could try to refuse to conclude that but uh it is really hard to do it alone even if i have that privilege years so i really needed a support and then so i saw this as a very rare opportunity to be able to talk about this, air this out, and then just take a wild chance to see if my feeling is right. My feeling was that it's not a personal problem. Other people might be experiencing it, but it was a wild chance because I felt like mm, this story about machinalization, uh, people who are living outside the Japanese context might I, it might not resonate as much. So that was the, another risk that I was seeing. Hmm. Um, I wonder if there's things that machinalization may have underestimated about your skills or your knowledge or your commitments that um, maybe through this, uh, it's coming to realize now and maybe not so happy to realize um i think that yeah um there were two probably two deadly underestimation on machinalization's parts i think uh, so the first one is I can take a wild chance once a uh, collective purpose 
for my contribution is within my field of vision, then I can take a chance and then I can become more fearless. So I can take off the glasses of taskization and then I'm like pumped to do something, contribute something, then I get fearless. I also, another part, I can, I can take a chance pretty shamelessly and fearlessly once fun adventure is within my vision and then I can be really uh, shameless about making sure that any of that fun and adventure is not spoiled by anything. So that part, I get very shameless. So uh, I think that part, machinalization, underestimated me. Mm. And um, what, what response has machinalization had? I'm not sure if you would know, but what, what do you suspect maybe uh, has been machinalization's reaction to you airing out his sneakiest tactics um, in this way? Um, has there been any kind of, you know, doubling down or maybe he's taking a pause to consider what his next moves should be, but what, what do you, what do you think his reaction has been or their reaction has been? Um, machinalization was really concerned at all first about me doing the summit because he totally thought it would be a rather sweet, perfect opportunity to crack down on human sumi. Uh, so he was good. It's like an automatic double down by me signing up, like volunteering to crack myself down. So, but, um, and then at some moment, I have to admit that he was, he was right at some moments. I was getting uh, machinalized by machinalization because, uh, yeah, at some moment, I was, when I was uh, making that video, as I, 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 I'm making about those, you know, tricks and stuff, how to trick Sumi, but I'm eating junk food <laughs> and spending ridiculous hours making that slide, and it's so ironic. Um, so, yeah, he was right in predicting that happening, but the difference was that um, I could actually found it funny, like, oh my God, this is so ironic that I'm spending ridiculous hours on making this slide. So I could just like, oh, I'm gonna go to bed. Like, this is way too ridiculous. And then I could just close the laptop and then just laugh about it. So that was a huge difference. And then um, I think when I, so I think I was, uh, close to getting machinalized when I was making the video. But the moment I start sharing that video with a bunch of super warm hearted people, and I start getting so many encouraging supports and comments and emails and lots of witnesses from many, many different parts of the world. That was super encouraging because that was exactly the huge part of what got me going about this salon. salon. So uh, yeah, the, once I got those feedback coming in and all the witnesses coming in and me, my face all brighten up with a huge smile on my face. And then that moment really shit hit the fan for the <laughs> machinalization. It was just all downhill from there for him. <laughs> uh, and so um, I'm wondering if maybe you've already said this, but I wonder now that the shit has hit the fan for machinalization, um, maybe what's, what, what gets liberated? for you, what's been liberated or what could possibly be liberated moving forward? 
definitely after I start getting all those super encouraging uh, feedback and then the witnesses from different parts of the world, I, I could notice myself becoming more creative, um, becoming more subversive at mm. machinalization, um, become more playful and feel like I want to make a, yeah, just make fun of them <laughs> and then have a laugh, good laugh about them with people. It, I, and then also, um, yeah, so I got this like adventurous, playful, creative spirit back. Uh, yeah, that got liberated. And also this excitement for yet to be known possibilities. That was, you know, the part of my original glasses of joy and pleasure and adventure. So yeah, I could get that back. So, um, you know, about the song, I had, I really had no idea what could unfold from here by exposing this um, mm. machinalization. But still, it, you know, through pascalization glasses, it would be really scary. Who knows what task might come out of it. But um, yeah, through this um, excitement for a yet to be known possibilities, I guess, um, yeah, as long as I'm not alone and feeling supported with, uh, from you guys, I feel like I'm really excited about not knowing what mm. can happen from here. Like I, it's really like a morning, all the mornings that I was experiencing at the during the narrative camp. Mm. Like that was when I start uh, recovering my original glasses of fun and adventure. When I wake up in Vermont, um, the beautiful uh, lake view and uh, you know we often had the afternoon free right no. and then I feel like I don't know what's gonna happen today and maybe some trouble could happen too but still I know it's gonna be good like including all the troubles it, I just know it's gonna be good with all these good people um, my side so it's just that kind of an adventure feeling that like it's almost welcoming of troubles hmm. so i think i'll ask one more question if there's i think there's time for one more i'm wondering about what your hopes are that this initiative that you've taken before today but this initiative that what it might make possible for you or for others, um, do you have certain hopes about what might become possible from this? Yeah, um, this is, um, yeah, while I was getting um, this encouraging feedback from many people, I got inspired to start this new initiative to collect witnesses of machinalization and machinalization's uh, relatives because he's got huge family and and then also yeah associates his associates so um if we could collect witnesses from all over the world any kind of like just spotting machinalization doing what um and who was being targeted for what time where did you spot the machinalization and then my hope for doing that is like if we could get long list of witnesses and then each witness is located in totally maybe different parts of the world that just make this machinalizations like it proves it makes it 
at least really hard to deny that it's an individual problem. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to do. And so when I speak with like Japanese people in my sessions, I want to invite them to contribute their witnesses to the list. And in the same way, I want to share the list with people I speak with. And, and that way, it just all, yeah, we can see it as a much bigger problem and then try to come up with more creative way together because hopefully it can generate some sense of community community of not being okay about this keep happening and machinalization just having everything he wants so um yeah, and then just take a stand together across the ocean, across the land, um, together, across the language differences, and take a stand together against the machinalization and in his wild, uh, wide family. And yeah, in solidarity, the sense of solidarity and community, like that's what I'm hoping for myself and the community. Mm. Thank you, Sumi-chan. Thank you, Amy-chan. So next, I think we're gonna, um, we'll invite Peggy to be an outsider witness um, to, to the conversation I had with, with Sumi. Um, and Peggy, are you all set? I'm all set, although uh, I want to uh, keep, I'll call him Mr. M from stepping in to make me feel like I have to cover it all or I will be a failure because you can see my page here. <laughs> These are the notes and I was somehow determined to um, uh, to write it all on one page. And I actually just realized I wrote it on the back of my visa to India. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I'm happy to do my best to say a few words and then we can open it up to everybody. Okay, thank you for agreeing to, to be a witness. Um, so maybe I'll just start out by asking you what, what really grabbed your attention as you were listening to Sumi describe um, any of the things that she that she talked about, you know, in terms of why this was important to her or anything else that you heard her say that that really struck you or captured your attention or your heart. Wow, there is really so much. Um, uh, when near the end, Sumi said, I don't know what's going to happen today, but I know it will be, um, you know, with good people. And the sense that Sumi talked about um, the uh, sense of collective purpose and, um, and that we can, and, and, and kind of reclaiming her sense of adventure and community. Uh, and, um, and that the initiative she's taken here really in tracing it back in time was indeed taking a chance. And it was through the connections with others that she's been reclaiming a sense of fun and connection, um, a realization that she's not alone, um, that I, I, I want to say that there's a, and energy and love. I, I want to bring in that word because um, I always find it a bit awesome how we don't see ourselves necessarily as others see us. And of course, when I um, watch Sumi and uh, her uh, warmth and uh, energy that comes forward and um, this sense of ethical integrity, um, that a commitment to that. Um, 
is, uh, is something that fills me with not only a sense of connectedness, but a sense of hope for the future. Um, because uh, these are also what I value most in life. And um, I was remembering a time, I think it was around when I was around 40, that I hit a wall and I felt like what I was doing, I thought I could just keep doing it that way. And somehow it was going to work and I would just get more and more energy. And I was finding myself getting increasingly more depleted. And, um, there, you know, at another time we can unpack that more, but I think, one thing that I discovered, and it's something that I love the conversations about, and I've done a number of these with my friend Charlie's, who's here, and with others, that there's a certain um, magic or synchronicity or serendipity, alchemy, synergy that seems to happen when we uh, don't try to do it alone. And we surround ourselves with people with shared values who we trust um, and where we can have together that sense of adventure. And um, that just makes me say, think, and want to give tribute to my mentor, Lynn Hoffman, because September the 10th, she would have been 95. And she died, I guess, two years ago, almost. But Lynn was the one who introduced me to the idea of the rhizome metaphor and not to think of things so linear, linearly and instead to be thinking just sort of like there's always this subterranean, you know, sending out of roots and shoots from the nodes that, that's underground and we don't, they pop up in different places. And I do have a strong sense that that's operating here and that we have a community that's coming together. I want to say one more thing about that, many more things, but um, I always want to remember as I'm observing or witnessing, experiencing a community coming together, I also want to really pay attention to people on the margins who don't have the sense of belonging, who feel excluded in some way or cautious, oh, these people know each other and I don't know, I'm an outsider for whatever the reasons. And I think we have work to be done there as well. But I so value Sumi's contribution here to bring us together around a shared sense of community um, and to take this wild chance together. Do we have time for me to ask you one more question or do you feel it's, it's better for us to move on? I could, I could put the question out there and you can tell me if you think sure. it's... Sure, I think we can have one more, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so now that you've been filled up, I guess, with the sense of community and sense of connectedness and and you you mentioned hope for the future I'm wondering how you're different maybe on account of having um, gotten filled up in this way or how what what difference it will make moving forward for you to to be filled up or to to have reconnected with this sense of uh, community and connectedness it's a beautiful question. Um, my hope has been for reauthoring teaching is one of, I'm sure, many communities that people belong to, that it's a place where we can be supporting people who, I say we, people like Charlie and Larry and me, and who are uh, somehow we've blinked our eyes and we are the older generation, don't know quite how that happened, but it has. And the idea that we're in this together 
and that we're using our voices, our knowledge, our supports, our power to help support people who are, haven't been in the field as long, but are still developing such skills and knowledge as the two of you are. Um, that is something that really, it just fills me with possibility and hope for the future that we can kind of slowly, when we slip away, there will be others who will carry this forward. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So um, now we're going to open it up, right, to, to everyone. Um, I'm not sure if the guiding questions, how we, how we, we didn't really talk through how we're going to go about this next part, but do, do you know, do you want to take this part away or should, let's see. Um, let me look at those guiding questions quickly and see if um, those would be, or any of us can, let us just think about this together, take our time and think for a moment about how we want to proceed. I'm sure people have lots to say. So the question is, do we want to open it up generally first and then go to the more specific questions or if we want to go to the specific questions? I like, I like Would that. Do you have a preference? Me? Yes. That's and do me, how about you? I feel, I love that you're putting it out there for people to choose what, what feels like a, the best fit. Yeah. I somehow think we should first go general and just hear some reflections from people um, that are in response to Sumi, in response to everything that they've, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the video, the interview, the reflection, let's just keep building on the cascading because we do have those questions that we'll post on the end and we want to make sure that people have time to be thinking about this as a league to move forward with. Wonderful. Did anyone? One thing I have learned from the collab, because some people are new here, um, mm -hmm. just there's no hurry. So silence is fine. So take your time. And uh, if someone has something to ask or to reflect on, um, we're eager to hear it. But you can, you know, we can create some space here too. Hi, this is Akansha and Jess. Hi, Akansha. Um, Hi, Akansha and Jess. Hi, we're in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and as, as some of you know, uh, I'm a doctoral student and M um, hangs out at doctoral students a lot. He um, it's also interesting to me, I think I'm noticing how uh, uh, M is a he, not a she. And I wonder about that. Um, and, I, and I wonder about what that decision you made, Sumi, to make M he, when maybe you go by she. So I was, I was thinking about that as you spoke. Um, and I think the other thing was, that, uh, for me, sometimes what M does is that with his tactics, he get he creates a lot of anxiety um, and disconnection from social and political values. So I really appreciate what you were saying about ethical integrity and what that means for me. Uh, but this was really, uh, I, I have to admit, I watched it while I was lazing in bed one morning and that felt like kicking M in the butt. Thank you. I, I, hi, Sumi. Hi, Amy. Hi, everybody. This is Marcy. Um, it's so nice to see you. It's so nice to see you. It's nice to see everybody. It's, um, it's really moving to see so many faces uh, from camp and other faces, too. Uh, First of all, I just wanted to say that uh, it feels like this 
circle here is filled with a lot of good medicine. And uh, I raised my hands to this community and I raised my hands to you, Sumye and, and Amy for your work today. Uh, one thing that struck me, uh, Sumye, watching your, your video was how uh, M is like, a, for me, I experienced it as some of the trickster stories I grew up with as a child. And in um, the stories I was told by my grandmother and my aunties, and they told lots of stories about these um, creatures who were very tricky and very clever. And um, they're really part of their, they created chaos in these stories. And uh, their creation of chaos was actually a way to uh, a sort of playful approach to really serious problems and uh, pointed out in some ways uh, the foolishness of some of our cultural practices and rules that we would cling to as humans. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and they disrupted um, outmoded structures and cultural rules. And a really popular version is the coyote stories that some people know from the cartoons about Roadrunner and Coyote. That's a sort of a cartoonized version. So I, I really, um, I felt very moved about uh, watching your, your, your video. I felt very connected with some old traditions as well as some new traditions mm -hmm. and um, I felt like uh, it breathed a lot of life and solidarity into my day. Uh, so thank you, Sumie, very much. And thank, thank you, you to everyone. Sumie. Hi, this is David in Ottawa. Hi, David. Thank Hi guys. So great to see you all, all of you again. And, uh, I just wanted to say how much I've appreciated this discussion and the video, which um, just sort of invite us much further into a topic that I feel that, you know, over the years, uh, we as a community have examined, you know, but it, it's just like the, there's so many um, layers and facets that you've, that you've brought out both through the, the, the video and through the conversation. So I feel like uh, I've been invited into a much uh, deeper uh, examination of this thing. And, and I, like Peggy, I filled an entire sheet like, oh, there's another one, you know, all kinds of stuff coming up. But I, you know, I can't touch on all of those, but I, there's, there's one that uh, I wanted to comment on. And that is, um, Sumi, you're, uh, you're uh, commenting on how in the process of making the video, M was kind of hovering over your shoulder and maybe pushing you a little bit. Um, yeah. But I was, I was also thinking about how, uh, about a distinction between some of those times when we burn the candle at both ends, uh, when we can't, you know, we can't rip ourselves away from the task at hand. Um, and in some cases, it, it, it may be a sense of, well, when we, when we examine it carefully, it may be, we may uh, notice that M is the, is, is the thing or person driving us. And other times we might discover that it, it's really, we're being pulled forward by, by a value that's very dear to us, very precious to us. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, sometimes when we, when we kind of, uh, you know, overdo it, maybe. Uh, it, 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 it's in a way that is richly satisfying and, and is us uh, devoting ourselves to a cause that's really important to us. So I guess the uh, question, and I'm not, I'm not looking for an answer right now, though, is just uh, how might we distinguish between the two, you know? When, how might we say, you know, okay, I should probably go to bed now, but but this is something that really deeply matters to me. And I'm doing this not to prove myself to M or to the world, but because I'm furthering 
a value that uh, is very precious to me. So mm -hmm. just a thought. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Sumi, um, thank you so much. That's the first time I've seen the video. I actually think that M was at work for me because I was trying to read every single word and I really felt the intensity and the pressure of of that that of M working in people's lives, just even the way you captured it with the images. Um, so thank you so much. Um, look, what stood out to me, there are a couple of things, and one was that um, having gone back to um, Japan and as a kind of an outsider and what that offers in the way of being a witness to the way things are done um, and that we don't always get that chance to look at a culture as a kind of outsider for a period of time and that you were talking about um, uh, that uh, the status quo, how you're sort of one of the big tasks is to kind of remain in the status quo. And so what you've done is actually found a, a very creative way to alert us to the way we could have conversations with others about resisting the status quo. And I loved what you said about um, that you took a chance when collective purpose was in your field of vision. And I kind of feel that that both in your work but also in Peggy um, and others who are making this forum possible, that this is this collective um, purpose. And I'm very grateful and thank you. Thank you, Greg. Here. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Sumi, thank hey. you for this. Uh, hey, hey. <laughs> thank you for this fantastic work. As you can imagine, uh, as I'm working in big corporations uh, as a narrative coach, uh, big corporations are like Disneyland for M. And uh, um, with your permission, I will use this uh, splendid video with uh, top executives because they all are servants. And I am a former servant of M. And um, what, what I found um, very interesting in your choice of setup is that M, uh, he has a machine voice, but he repeats uh, <laughs> some words. He has glitches, mm -hmm. like, and uh, I think it's, it's a very interesting narrative choice you made in the editing of the uh, video to, to put some glitches because it's, it's some more, some hope uh, that um, it says that M repeats the same patterns all the time and that we are creative and we can, uh, we can take over maybe on him using this way he has to, to, to repeat always the same things. And he sounds a little bit like an old rusted robot, you know? And uh, um, it makes you feel so living to, to hear this uh, mechanical voice. So, so uh, bravo for this uh, scenaristic choice. And this is really an inspiring, super inspiring work. So thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. can only wonder about the effects that it's going to have on M as these corporate executives through Pierre's <laughs> initiation uh, start uh, uh, seeing the video and, and M gets uh, exposed on such a high level as that. I'm excited about that. M will be excited too. Bobby, it looked like you had something to say. Well, I was thinking it was interesting. Thank you, Pierre, for uh, that other perspective because the editor in me was like, oh, that, that's a mistake. <laughs> it's repeating. And yet now I see the advantage and um, wonder about the subtleties of it. Um, I, I especially like this 
and I was going to say in Japanese, domo arigato. Thank you very much. It's the only Japanese I know. And um, I, uh, this is, comes at an interesting time for me as I'm choosing my preferment and uh, thinking about what aspects uh, I want to keep in and, and let go. I really liked um, what resonated was stepping on the gas and the brake at the same time. And um, I think that gets to what David also, uh, David uh, from Ottawa was saying, uh, something about this stop and go, this pressure and this give back and what do we give and what do we take? And uh, anyway, I, I found it. And I, I love the um, cartoon aspect of this, the puppet and um, playfully playing with these ideas not only you know, just how do we take care of ourselves and also thinking about uh, the people that come to us with their dilemmas. Um, and societally, I had this kind of uh, inspiration. I think some of you may have seen that uh, I, I met with Linda Moxley in Montreal on Friday and I was taking a day off a vacation day and um, we toured uh, sort of what they call Jewish Montreal in an open air museum where you um, travel and see what happens to different uh, places along the path of where Jews used to live in Montreal. And then what happened, not because they were asked to leave a neighborhood, but because progress ensued and what did progress do to their identity. And um, I think you asked a very important question and, and the big C, capitalism, and, and what does this do to identity and who we are and what we see as progress um, and just being cautious and being aware that this happens. Um, and yet, what is the cost? And what I saw on Friday was it, it cost places of worship. It cost places of learning and it, it changed the culture uh, to something different. And it's not good, it's not bad, but it is just an awareness. Um, and uh, so anyway, I, I, uh, that ha I had that sort of epiphany while watching it again today. And I thank you very much for uh, this contribution to our awareness. Thank you, Bobby. Bobby, it's Mike and Rocio from San Diego. We're on the telephone. I, I want to thank you for bringing up this idea of progress um, only because um, Sumi and Amy, you both in this wonderful, um, this wonderful work, you've got me thinking about not only how I'm thinking about progress out there, but also progress. I don't want to go into out there in, in here, but something like how I've been calling progress and naming progress for now more than four decades and having a really real reconsideration of that. And um, I'm just so appreciative to, to get this sort of uh, way to reconsider some of my stories and some of the ways that others have told me about progress and ways that I have been thinking about it and now ways that I might want to think otherwise about progress. So Bobby, thanks for bringing that word in the conversation and thanks to all of you. You know, Mike, it, it brings up for me when, when I was just listening to your voice and thinking about, you know, the, the many, many gendered stories involved in gendered relational politics of all of what M's up to. And it got me thinking about in the old days, we used to talk about how men were more subject to these provider discourses, you know. Uh, being a good provider and uh, and how brutal that was to family relations and um, so I, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, some strong feelings about that and uh, express my love and appreciation for fathers and um, my father and many of my male relations who were subject to am in, in really brutal ways. 
in terms of being good providers, being good um, carers of their families. So thanks. Simi, this is Sarah Marks in Maine. How are you? Great to hear you. I, um, I had a lot of things I was thinking. I really, really connected to when you were talking about the community piece and building this community going forward, maybe of stories of where machinalization is showing up and um, how and who it's who he's targeting. And um, I was thinking also about, I mean, I heard in you today, like some stories about the ways that you were able to escape machinalization or um, I don't know what word you would use, but resist that, whether that was about building community or having fun or laughing or being able to find what was ironic about that. And I was thinking about all the places those stories might be and maybe old about machinalization's boss, you know, the capitalism boss, scappy guy. Um, and just like, coming back from living in Costa Rica like a year ago where um, I felt like there were like all these knowledges around resisting machinalization that I had never really heard before. I wonder what different ones there are in all the different countries and cultures that we all listen come from, other people who might listen to this in the future might come from. Um, because there were like clearly a lot of knowledges there that I didn't have. Um, and I don't know, it was interesting to be listening to you. I think today I remember a friend of mine there talking to someone who we knew who was really good at English, going, oh, you should teach English, and you should do this, and you should do that, and this gentleman just looking at them and being like, why would I do that? Because, like, I'm really good. Like, I have the house I want, and I'm happy, and I have enough to eat, and we have socialized medicine, we have really good education, and college is free, and you know, all these things that Cappy probably doesn't like so much. And all these, a the totally different perspective and knowledge that I really didn't have about realizing that I didn't need to be a machine and keep figuring out like what to do more and what to do better and what to do next. That, um, I don't know, I was just listening to you and thinking about different places I've been and how many more knowledges are probably out there that I haven't gotten to listen to yet that I'd like to hear from. I miss for the conversation because my sound cut out at one point. Um, so I'm sorry for hard to miss, but I really appreciated it. And um, I like your idea of the community getting like, bigger and more people being able to participate in this and the stories and to grow that further. Because I suspect there's a lot of um, tricks and knowledges out there about resisting that I don't know about yet. So thanks. Hey, I think that um, Sarah's reflection is like a plant here for us of, um, I want to make sure that others who really feel a burning desire to speak have an opportunity. And I'm also aware of the time. And when Sarah is describing um, wanting to learn more from people in different contexts about the presence of M in their lives, I just want to acknowledge that we're starting to move toward what you, Sumi, had said earlier about this not being a one-time thing, but instead that you've actually given some thought about how to gather as fellow investigative reporters, in a sense, what we can learn about the presence of M in various people's lives. So. I just want to mark that we're moving toward that, but before to give an opportunity to anyone who's really got something burning that you want to say, in particular, who hasn't spoken yet. Kitty. Hi, hi Peggy. Um, I'm just uh, going to translate here for Dave, who's up in La Serena. He has something he'd like to add. Um, first, thank you very much to me <laughs> and, and Amy for your wonderful talk. Uh, he's been thinking two ideas. The first is that uh, how machinalization um, affects our relationships with ourselves and with the context that we live in um, and how it makes us or forces us to think of how we should operate and, uh, through uh, demands and uh, worse, that we always have to do it, that we're always forced to do, to do and to operate in this way through um, obligation. 
and uh, and then the second thing is that it, uh, once you understand or once this mechanism is revealed, uh, the, the the hopefulness and the power of saying no, uh, and the the it gives us the opportunity to protest and a space for differences, um, and uh, without having uh, having to feel guilty about saying no today I cannot and I do not want to. And that this uh, this uh, way of being is 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 kind of revolutionary. So that's what that's what I'm just translating there for Dave. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone else have something that you really thank you, Dave, and thank you for the translation, Kitty. Um, I love that, that we have Spanish here and French and Japanese and, um, and English and all sorts of things. But how about anyone else? It sounds like Mona, you have something you want to add. Yeah, I just want to say a quick thank you and hello to everybody. And, you know, one, one of the things that I'm taking away from this, Sumi and Amy, is how M can unwillingly deputize us into you know in our other roles as moms and teachers and supervisors and wives and husbands to carry on that work um, i think i've gotten a handle a little bit i'm sitting out on my patio enjoying the day and not doing notes and other things um, i think i have a handle on stepping away and saying no to m in my identity as a person but it's harder when i'm inhabiting these other roles so i want to think about that more so thank you for everybody's reflections. One more before, thank you, Mona. One more before we uh, move into what we had planned for next. Hi, hi everyone, this is Rocio from San Diego. I guess I was really thinking about um, really pushing doing away with charts at my work. There's a lot of like percentages and this whole numerical thing behind uh, this process that I'm really um, pushing away from at work and, and realizing the impact on uh, being a clinical supervisor. I love what Mona just said about deputizing. And so I've really kind of instilled um, some thought into what is a good therapist um, at work. It's come up a lot and the notion that you really have to work hard and uh, productivity um, and even from before from Vermont, uh, Pierre also, uh, I think it's been kind of working its way into my brain to think about uh, what my role is in that. And so my interns are often surprised when I tell them to take the day off. Um, and I'm kind of a, a little, uh, how do you say, cuando estás diciéndoles, like against it, how do you say, revolting? <laughs> I like revolting often, so is that the right word? Yes. So um, I'm kind of taking pleasure in that, but I'm really enjoying uh, the video and I, I'm chuckling over imagining Sumi being just in her creative way um presenting this to us and i'm just yeah i just really enjoy thinking about a lot of these things and but i love that word mona um that you've used today with the kind of the deputizing or how we get uh tricked into you know the tactics of um becoming good therapists and clinical supervisors in, in the professional field so thank you thank you thank you before we move into um, Sumi and Amy, your thoughts about what comes next, I did want to just put in a quick plug for uh, next time because um, in October we have um, a narrative therapy approach following in Michael White's footsteps to those who hear voices. And again, we've been really stretching ourselves to invite people who are accepting, who live in different time zones. And our main presenter, um, Christopher, lives in Denmark. And I know it will be kind of like Pierre was saying, something like 11 o'clock at night for him, which will be, would be torture for me. Um, 
but um, he and David Epson are going to be presenting um, this salon, and I'm sure it's going to be also a really good one. And so I hope you guys can join us. And um, Sum Sumi and Amy, shall we then talk about what I think my impression is that if we thought we had to cover all of this in one hour and a half, it would have added stress and that instead, and it would have allowed M to come in in a sneaky way. And so instead we thought of this as the beginning of an investigative uh, um, inquiry. So um, do you want to just describe that a bit and I can add on them whatever, whatever I have on the website and things like that. You mean about the um, witnesses wanted? Yes, and then also the PDF, which I'll put up uh, as well. Yes, so uh, um, should we share the screen? That would be great. For that website? Do you, want, do you want to do that? Yeah, that would be... Uh, do, I can do that. Excellent. Do you see? Yep. Yeah, right? just scroll down. Okay, so this is the reoffering teaching website, and then go under the anti machinalization summit and go down. And here, witnesses wanted from around the world, and then there is uh, some welcoming words and an um, invitation for all the fellow investigator and then um, so anyone um, anyone who are participating today and then, then but not only that um, you guys clients family friends anyone are welcome to share the witnesses and then here a name um, country um, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the one. An email, a name of the suspect. Yeah, it can be machinalization, cousin, daily grind. And uh, yeah, the, if you could share the tricks and tactics that you end up spotting or hearing about through your clients. And um, yeah. And then where you spotted, and then yeah, rough description of M Target, and uh, yeah, any other clues? This would be great. Any description you wanted because um, it's been really hard to get a um, full picture of the, the scale how, scale the M's operation. And then, yeah, at the end, it would be okay, it would be great if you could say it's okay to be contacted for further information. Because, um, yeah, if I really want this to be not like a one-time interesting thing, it has to be keep going and developing and then, then keep inspiring further initiative. So I'm just hoping that this will just uh, create yet to be seen exciting possibilities for uh, more um, new initiative to become. So uh, that's, oh, and then the guiding questions. We, so, <laughs> because um, Amy and I were super enthusiastic about creating guiding questions for the summit we end up ended up coming up a lot of questions for guiding questions so we didn't end up um being able to use all uh all of it but um we would love to share these guiding questions that we didn't get to use during this alone but this is going to be a continuing theme Anyway, so if you could use these questions to uh, keep reflecting or maybe uh, 
spark up some conversation with your friends and families and loved ones, uh, that would be great. And how can we share that PDF guiding questions, Peggy? I will, um, I'll put it in the next few days, we'll get the recording for today up on the website. And we'll also put the PDF there that anyone can download. Some people here are also teachers. I think it'd be great to share with students um, or uh, to share with, with teachers, you know, but anyone, let's get everybody thinking about these questions. And I just want to say a special thank you both to Sumi um, and to Amy. This was awesome. This was so much fun. It's <laughs> like we're, um, I think we're really resisting M's clutches here. I have a quick question, uh, Peggy yeah. and Sumi, I think. Is there any way to add uh, the option uh, to upload photographs to uh, the, the future spottings of, of M? Oh, I'm, what a great idea. Yeah, the visuals would be really exciting. Yeah. Did you have one in mind, Charlie? Oh, my mind is racing. Um, no, I just, uh, you know, I, I love the visual images. So I'm just thinking if we could collect yeah. those from different people. Um, they, they can tell stories just, just themselves. Great. I'll add that. And I'm unclear whether they can upload it right on to the gravity form or whether you just email it to me as an attachment, but I'll put that bat on. That's a great idea. Cool. Thanks again to both of you. This was so exciting and to everybody who participated. Thank you so Thank you. much. That's been incredible. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Oh, hey, those of you who know Michael Costelli, he now has a, a new baby daughter. He would have been here, but he uh, wasn't able to join us. So I wanted to tell you that. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.